Well, let's dive into our message today. I'm excited to dive in. We are kicking off a brand new series called Foundations. Foundations. And uh, here's sort of the, the thought behind this series. And really, as I was praying through this series, um, you know, I was reminded, even while I was driving in this morning, when I, when I kind of saw the large Marriott building, I remember several years ago when they were building that building. Uh, and they, were, they actually started off by deep, big, or, or digging a very, very, very deep foundation. Anyone remember that here if you live in Bethesda? And uh, now that building is very, very high. And we know that structurally in order to build a tall building, you must have a deep foundation. Uh, and in the same way in your life, in order for you to experience all that God has for you, to walk according to the purpose of God, to experience the blessings of God, you must have a deep foundation. If you believe it, can you say amen? amen. In fact, the words of Jesus, uh, he said this. It's kind of our theme uh, passage for the series. He says, Any, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Can anybody you grew up in Sunday school singing the wise man build? Anybody else? Just three of us. Okay. We're... Uh, We'll move on. All right. Um, the rain came down. I'm sorry. My brain just goes random places sometimes. Um, the rain came down. The streams rose. The winds blew and beat against that house, and it did not fall because it had its, read that word together, foundation on the rock. Foundation matters. So, in, in fact, one of our, our, our value statements as a church is that Jesus is our foundation. The words of Christ was that Jesus is our chief cornerstone. That he is the foundation on which we build our life. And in this series, we're going to be looking at foundational elements of our faith and how we can build a firm foundation in our faith so we can experience all that God has for us in this life. But first, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, we pray that as we open it up today, God, that you would speak to us. Uh, Father, we just thank you for your word, and we just posture our hearts and minds to receive from you today. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 11 is where we're going to look today, and the, and the, the foundational component of our faith we're going to look at today um, is actually the concept of faith. Uh, we're going to look at this idea of what does it mean to have faith in God. And uh, faith is, is, a, is a big theme in the Bible. Uh, in fact, we're going to look at Hebrews, the book of Hebrews today, chapter 11. It's known as the hall of faith uh, because in this passage, the author of Hebrews really describes many men and women who are the greats of our faith, who lived lives of, of great faith, and God did incredible things through them. In fact, the book of Hebrews, faith is one of the main themes. 35 times it mentions the word faith in the book of Hebrews. In fact, the book of Hebrews, if you're uh, a follower of Christ, to give some context, Romans, the book of Romans written by Paul is known as one of the most doctrinal uh, heavy books. But following that is the book of Hebrews. It's one of the most doctrinal and theological books of the Bible. Um, we don't know the exact author, author. Many presume it was a pastor. That's why some actually presume it was Paul who wrote Hebrews because the tone's very pastoral. Uh, he's writing as if a pastor would write to his congregation. And it's also very practical. So it's a great book to read because it's theological and doctrinal. So you get a good understanding of the theology of our faith. Uh, which is an understanding of God. But then it's also very practical, which I love the practical nature of the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews 11, if you were to say, what is like one, you know, if, if I were to read one chapter of the Bible to learn about faith, where would I read? We would say you should read Hebrews chapter 11 uh, because it is the quintessential chapter on faith. So we're going to spend most of our time there today. If you have your Bibles, you can read Hebrews 11. We're going to read four scriptures here in the beginning. Verse 1, it says this, that faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Verse 6, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I want to talk today from the topic of a faith that God rewards, a faith that God rewards. Here's the first point. Uh, If you're taking notes, I'm just going to share three qualities of the faith described in Hebrews and three qualities of a faith that we should all have in Christ. And here's the first one is that faith trusts, faith trusts. It says faith is the confidence of what we hope for, the assurance of what we do not see. Now, this word faith Um, is not necessarily in this verse a particular um, Christian word. It's a a word of of faith, generally speaking. And I I know we live in a culture that's very, very rational. Uh, We're very educated people here in the room and those online. But here's the reality. We are all people of faith. We all live by faith. As much as we like to think we live purely purely by what we know. We actually live every day of our lives by faith. Case in point, when you got in your vehicle this morning to come to church, you had faith the people you were passing by on the other side weren't going to cross over those yellow lines and hit you head on. Come on. Now, when you got in that Uber car, you had faith in the driver would get you where you're going safely. When you have lunch this afternoon, you're putting faith in the cook that they're going to make your food safely. Come on, when you fly in a plane to go somewhere, you put your faith in the pilot that he will get you to where you're going safely. Tomorrow morning when you go to work or you go to go to school, you, you put your faith that, listen, if I put in a good day's work, if I do my job well, that I'll have a job to come to on Tuesday morning. Are you following me, church? We are people of faith whether we like it or not because we are constantly having to put our faith. Come on, married people. When you get married, you put your faith in the other person, don't you? So, so here the author of Hebrews is making the case that we should put our faith in God. Why? Because we can have confidence in God. That word assurance means that we can be convinced that, that who God says he is and what God says he will do, he will do. Now, when you're convinced of something, it's because you have proof of something. And the author of Hebrews is saying, we have proof of who God is and what he will do because we have The word of God. I love what Moses wrote in Numbers 23, 19. He says, God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Moses was comparing God to the little g gods of the Near East. And he was saying, listen, God, Yahweh, the true God, is not a human. He's not. He's reliable. He's faithful. He will do what he says he will do. In the book of Joshua, it says that every single promise God gave to the children of Israel, he fulfilled. Malachi 3.6 says, God can not change. He is the same today, yesterday, forevermore. Psalm 77.22, David writes this, I praise you with music on the harp. I don't know if we have any harp players here this morning. Because you are faithful to your promises. That God is a faithful God. He he does what he says he will do. Culturally speaking, we like faithful things. We like reliable things. Case in point, you're the number one, the best-selling automobile manufacturer in the United States of America is Toyota. Come on, you don't buy a Toyota because it's sleek. Come on, somebody. You don't buy a Toyota because it's fast. Why do you buy a Toyota? Because you can drive that thing to 280,000 miles. Come on, somebody. And all you did was two oil, two oil changes. Come on. The number one, number one and two hotel franchises in the United States is Marriott, headquartered right here in Bethesda, and Hilton, which we're in a Hilton hotel right now. Why? Because you know, regardless of what Marriott you go to, regardless of what Hilton you go to, you're going to get a certain quality of an experience, right? We like reliability. We like consistency. We like faithfulness. Hear me, church. Our God is faithful. He is the most faithful person in the entire world. Now, let me give you two, just just a brief caution. Sometimes we can, we can maybe misperceive God's faithfulness because we can actually project 
the, un, the faithfulness or lack thereof of people on God. And we can say, well, because my, my father wasn't faithful, he left when I was young, God's not faithful. Uh, because I had a, maybe a, a church leader in my life who wasn't faithful to their word, then God's not faithful. Maybe because I had a spouse who wasn't faithful to me in marriage, God's not faithful. Can I caution you to not place the projection of an imperfect person upon a perfect God? And, and, and secondly is this, is sometimes we can actually misperceive God's faithfulness. Based on, I've done this in the past, so please hear there's no condemnation, is that sometimes what we can do is we actually, because God, because God did not answer your prayer in the way you were expecting, we judge him as unfaithful. We, we say, God, you didn't do what I thought you should do. Who am I in my finite mind to determine what an infinite God should do? And, and when, have you ever had this moment, listen, because we've all been there, Right? Like, if you've ever had, if I went out in the room, we probably all have stories of prayers we prayed, of things we're believing for that God did not do. But on the flip side, have you ever had this moment before? That there was something in your life at one point you were praying for that God did not answer in the way you were hoping, but then maybe some months, some years pass, and you actually think, God, he didn't answer that prayer? Come on, you prayed that that relationship would, would end in marriage. And then you went to your college reunion, and you saw the brother, and you were like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Woo! You did not answer that prayer. Thank you, God, you're infinite, and I, and I am finite. Come on, have you been there? Right? Come on, Christina has many guys in her past. She says, thank you, God. Thank you, God, he wasn't the one. You sent your chosen one in Jeremy. Come on. I'm sorry, I got the microphone in my face, so I'm... I'm I shouldn't have said that. That was, that was wrong. Okay. Back to being spiritual. Come on, you were praying for that job. But if you have gotten that job, you wouldn't have actually heard about the job that came three months later. That you're even more fulfilled than you would have been if you got the job that you wanted. Listen, listen. I, and listen, I understand when prayers aren't answered and we can be disappointed. But please just hear me is to not, to not limit an infinite God by your finite mind. We are limited. He is not. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. The Bible says his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Maybe some of you today, you need to, you need to praise God for an unanswered prayer in your past. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful he cannot change. You know what that means? The promises, there are promises written in Scripture, over 600 promises in the Scriptures. God cannot change. And the Bible says every single one of his words will fulfill its purpose. It will not return void. And we have, a, we have historically proof of God fulfilling his word. There are promises that God has for your life that the Scriptures say God will fulfill. Let me give you a few of them this morning. Here, here, here's, listen, here are some promises. That, that, that is true for our life, whether or not we believe them or not, it is a true truth for our life. Here it is, that God will never leave you nor forsake you, that God will work all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, that he will comfort you in your affliction, that he will give you a peace beyond all comprehension, that he will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ, that he will finish the work he's begun, he will bring it to completion in you, that he will do exceedingly and abundantly and above all you could ever ask, think, or imagine. These are the promises of God for your life. God is trustworthy. So what's our response to a trustworthy God? Is we put our trust in him. A little bit, bit later in Hebrews 11, one of the main characters of Hebrews 11, the main historical figures the author highlights is Abraham and Sarah. I'm not going to go deep into the details. You can read their life for yourself in the book of Genesis, beginning in Genesis 12. But I'm going to read a few scriptures about them. It says this in verse 11, that by faith, even Sarah who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him, God, faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, referring to Abraham and from Sarah, and he was as good as dead, 
Come on, how many of you know you're old when the Bible says you're good as dead? Come on, somebody. You're like, you want your old Abraham? You as good as dead, Abe, eh? you know? You just got to find humor in the Bible sometimes. <laughs> now, don't go home and say, hey, mom, you as good as dead. Don't say that, okay? <laughs> Came descendants as as numerous as the stars of the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. That Sarah considered God faithful. Now, listen, if you know the story of Sarah, I won't go into details. Sarah wasn't perfect. Abraham wasn't perfect. That's a whole other message. But here's what I want to encourage you with today. Is that sometimes we can, we can make the mistake to believe. Because Sarah had a moment in her life that's documented in the canonized word of God where she doubted God. And if we're not careful, listen, I want you to hear this. Faith and doubt can coexist. Sometimes we think that, that if I doubt God, then I don't have faith. Can I, can I encourage someone today? If you walk with God long enough, the question is not if you will doubt. The question is when you will doubt. Because you will have a moment in your life where a prayer is not answered, where a desire is not fulfilled, and you will question God. Can I give you some pastoral encouragement this morning? Is that when you doubt, do not lean away from God, but lean into God. When you doubt, do not stop reading his word. Seek him more in his word. When you doubt, do not stop coming to church and being on the people of God. Like, spend more time with the people of God. Do not wrestle with your doubt apart from God. Wrestle with your doubt with God. You know, there's a, there's a moment in the Gospels where, where this, this, this father is, is asking Jesus to heal his daughter. And here's what he says. He says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Faith in doubt. But catch the man. What did he do? He, he didn't go and talk to his friend who didn't believe and say, yeah, I don't know if I believe. He went to Jesus himself. Lord, help me believe. I want to believe you, but I'm, but I'm disappointed. I want to believe you, but I question why that prayer wasn't answered. Can I encourage you today? God can handle your doubts, but don't lean away from him. Lean towards him. In Proverbs 3, it says this, that Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. That word trust, actually, I was even rereading this morning the original Hebrew there. It literally means to, to lean against helplessly. It, to trust means Trust means I am completely in your hands. I am leaning completely towards you. I am helpless. The Bible says to trust. It means to place your weight upon the Lord. Now, here's a truth that I think we need to, we need to grasp before we go forward. The reality is this, that in our life, we, 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 we put our trust, we're, we're going to put our trust in something. We're, we're going to put the weight of our life on something. And, and, and we don't have to go far and deep into our own lives or, or our culture to know that when we put our weight upon other people and other things, it eventually breaks. Case in point, how many have ever heard of someone, and please hear this, if this is you, there's no condemnation. Please hear this. But have you ever heard someone say they were getting a divorce because I'm no longer happy in this marriage? They place the weight of their happiness upon their spouse. Can I encourage you today? There is no spouse on this earth that can ever bring you happiness. Ever. Or, or people will place the weight of their peace on their possessions. If I just had a little more money, and then you, have you ever been there where you thought, man, if I just had a little more, then I'd be good. Then you get there and you thought, if I just had a little more, then I'd be good. Then you get there. If I just had a little more, then I'd be good. Listen, you're never going to be good. <laughs> because money was not supposed to give you a peace beyond all comprehension. God was. Are you following me, church? Yeah. Or you'll place your fulfillment on a job. And people will leave job after job after job because I'm no longer fulfilled. Can I tell you, that job at, at NIH was never intended to fulfill your soul. At Walter Reed, at, in business, in education. Listen, work is a gift from God. You are called to work. But your fulfillment cannot come from your job. 
we, 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 we got to be careful because if we place our weight upon things and people, it'll break it. But we can place our weight fully on God. I want to give you a visual illustration of what this looks like to place your weight on God because the reality is we all have weights that we carry. And we all need God to carry them for us. I'm going to invite my friend Demetrius up here. Come on, give it up for Demetrius. Demetrius is playing the humble role of God this morning. So <laughs> he is 33, you know, the age Jesus was, although when he died. So I'm sorry. I mean, you know, <laughs> you brought it up earlier. Okay, I didn't. I didn't. But, but here's the reality is, is we're carrying weight that we were not intended to carry by ourselves. That we carry the weight of our anxieties, the weight of an unknown future. The weight of our purpose, the weight of children. And the Bible says we can cast our cares upon the Lord and he will sustain you. So listen, you cannot carry the weight of your anxieties. But can I tell you, I know someone who can. Can I tell you, you can't carry the weight of those kids. And all the parents said, amen, but your God can. You cannot carry the weight of your purpose, but who can? God. And see, here's what can happen. You can cast your cares about your finances, about your marriage. Listen, maybe you cannot resolve the tension in your marriage, but I know someone who can. So over the course of time, what you do is you cast your cares. You put your weight upon God. Weight in and of yourself. I can't even close this, God. Weight in and of yourself that you cannot carry on your own. But can I tell you, I know someone who can. Come on, give it up for Demetrius. Thank you. I love you, brother. Now, he's going to wear that all day to show you how God can carry your weight 24 I'm just kidding. I love what David says here in Psalm 62, 2. Truly, he, referring to God, is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Now, David didn't write this when life was all comfortable. Here's what was happening in David's life when he wrote this. King Saul. Watch this. David was anointed to be king. And the current king was chasing him with an army to kill him. And David pens Psalm 62 too. What does he say? My rock is not in my purpose to be the next king. My, my, my rock is not in anything of this world. It is in God. You know, it says, in all of your ways, submit to him. So what does it mean? Maybe for you this morning to trust in God is you need to cast some weight upon him today. What is it that's been keeping you up at night? What has been causing stress right now in your life? Have you given that thing to God? Secondly, it says, in all of your ways, submit to him in Proverbs 3. What that means is in every area of my life, I'm not going to lean solely on my own understanding. I'm going to lean on God's understanding. Faith, trust. Faith, trust. Here's the second point. is faith acts. Faith acts. It says, by faith, Hebrews 11, 8, Abraham, who called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going, that, that Abraham obeyed, that our faith is active, that our faith has legs. You know that in the Old Testament, when it refers to faith, it refers to trusting in God. In the New Testament, when it refers to faith, it refers to obeying God. That Abraham obeyed God. Abraham did not just believe God, but he obeyed God. Jeremiah 7, 23 says this. The Lord speaks to the Israelites. Obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you that it may go well with you. Now he writes this because they were, at this time and place in history, they were going through the motions. They were, they were coming to the temple, but they weren't really coming to worship. Uh, they were giving an offering, but they weren't giving their hearts. So the Lord offers a correction this moment. He says, he says, obey me. Here's what he says. Hear this. He's not saying, listen, and I want you to hear this very clearly. God is not, he's not in the business of behavior modification. He's in the business of heart transformation. The Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the 
You can do the right thing for the wrong reason. Come on. And, and, and here's what he's saying. Is, is he's saying, put your heart into it. Have you ever been before at a restaurant where you, I, I know I've seen this where I'll be out and Christina, I'll be having a date and I'll look across the restaurant. You ever seen a couple that'll be out on a date and both of them look like miserable and they're both scrolling their phones? It's like, man, I can't wait to get married. You know, it's, it's so ma- amazing. And, and I wonder to myself, are you just going through the motions? Is, is, have you, you've been married for so long, you've been together for so long, maybe Saturday night's just date night. So you just go out on Saturday night, but your, your heart's not in it. And if we're not careful, we can go through the motions of our faith and our heart not be in it. You know, the other day I was at the gym and I had this thought because, you know, it's easy when you're working out at the gym that you can go through the motions when you're working out. And, and you'll, you'll see people that they've been lifting like the same weight for like a whole year, two years, right? I have some, some weights this morning. We're going to get a little workout today. Welcome to Jeremy's workout tape. We're so glad you came today, right? And they got the same weights they've been lifting for like two years. And they're having a full conversation while they're lifting. Like, hey, have you seen that new Batman? Yeah, me either. Yeah, I thought it was trash too. Yeah, you know. And they're lifting, having full conversations. On a side note, if you can have a full conversation while you're lifting weight, you ain't lifting weight. Come on, somebody. That's a word for somebody. If you can have a full conversation with someone. I saw a brother the other day. He had his Bluetooth on having a phone conversation. I'm like, bro, you ain't working out. Just go. Just leave. You cannot have a conversation. Your body clearly is not challenged right now. We know what I love? I love when I see those people in the gym, right? And they got a little heavier weight. Come on, be impressed. Be impressed. Come on. And they're like profusely sweating. And they look real intense, like they're about to kill somebody. Come on. There's like, like you know, they got their headphones on. Like, they, like, if you try to get their attention, you can't get their attention. Like, they're just like, they're like angry, right? But how many of you know that person who is lifting, maybe while angry, <laughs> like while profusely sweating, they're challenging their body. How many of you know, if you are at the gym working out while having a full conversation about your favorite Netflix series, you're probably not going to see the results you're hoping for. But if you're out there and you go in and you get it, right, and you, you, you are profusely sweating, you exhaust your body, you're going to see the results. Listen, can I, can I give a word of, of, of warning to those who've been following God for a while? Be careful in your faith you do not go through the motions. That you come to church because you've always come to church, but you don't actually come to worship. That, 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 that you, you, you read the word of God, but you're not actually opening the word expecting to receive a fresh word from God for you that day. That if we're not careful, we can go through the motions. We can do the right things without the heart. We can give because I've always given. And listen, please hear this as well. If it's truly heart transformation, it should leave in evident behaviors. That's the ways of Jesus. It's clear. But but he's not just about trying to to change your behavior. He's trying to change your, your heart. That's why he says in John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. He's not trying to just get you obey to modify your behavior. He's trying, to, he's trying to have a relationship with you where you receive his love and you love him. See, in John 15, the next chapter, he says, remain in my love. And here's what happens. Listen, here, here's what I think. If you find yourself going through the motions, if you've ever thought, listen, and I say this with, with compassion and gentleness, but if you ever open the word of God and you say, I didn't get anything out of that, the problem is not God, it's you. If you come to church in the presence of God and saying, I didn't get anything from that, the problem is, is me. It's not God. Are you following me, church? That, that it's us, it's our heart. Is, is our heart in it? Are we not just going through the motions, but is our, is our heart in it? Because he wants, and listen, here's how, you, here's how you get your heart in it. Here's what I found personally. When you begin to lose heart, I have lost sight of how good God is. 
I have lost sight. I have, I have, it's left my consciousness of how much he loves me, how much he's forgiven me, how good his mercies are that are new every morning, how his grace is sufficient. Because when you live in the reality that I need God's forgiveness daily, I need his mercy every morning, I need his grace every day, I need his love every moment. When you live with that awareness... And you realize how good he is? The natural response is love. And the obedience that comes is not like I got to obey him because if I don't, I'll be upset. It's, man, I want to obey you because you're so good to me. Are you following me, church? That we, we, it's out of love. James says this in James 2. Someone, say, you have, someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God. That's good. Watch this. Even the demons believe that and shudder. As the body of the spirit is dead, so is faith without deeds is dead. Here's, here's, here's this, what he's saying here. Is that our faith should naturally produce deeds. I think sometimes, and I'll I'll use this term, but I think sometimes it can be a faulty term um, if we're not careful, is we can refer to those of us who follow Christ as believers. But if it stays at belief and never actually leads into action, James says your faith, your belief is dead. Now, he's not not contradicting what Paul said that said we're justified by grace through faith. What he's saying is the other side of the coin, that if you have true faith, if you, have, if you truly love God, it should produce something on the inside of you. I'll put it this way. If I said I loved Christina, but I never showed her affection, would you, would you believe me? If I said I loved Christina, but I never told her I loved her. If I said I loved Christina, but I never served her at my home, would you question if I really loved her? And listen, here's what James is saying. If you love God and you have faith in God, that means you should be growing in self-control. If you love God and have faith in God, you should be growing in generosity. If you love God and you have faith in God, you should be growing in forgiveness. Over the course of time, you should be coming more quick to forgive. You should have, as I said last week, thicker skin and a softer heart. That you should have more of a posture of service. You should be coming more of a kind person, a less judgmental person. Are you following me, church? Because our faith should produce deeds. Our, our belief should manifest in behaviors. And Jesus says this, blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. But blessed are those who hear the word and do the word. That word blessed is the word makarios in the Greek. It means happy. He says you're happy when you hear my word and you put it into practice. I remember back when I was in high school, I played high school baseball and basketball, and uh, I remember when I was in high school, I like, I was, I remember I was looking forward to that day when I got my Letterman's jacket. Come on, somebody. Anybody still have your Letterman's jacket? Come on. On a side note, if someone's in their 30s and they still wear a Letterman's jacket, run from them, okay? I don't know who needed to hear that. Maybe you're dating a man, he still wears it. Just end it, okay? That's weird, okay? I shouldn't have said that. We'll move on. I love you if, you if you still wear it, but you probably shouldn't. It's probably why you're still single. Okay, I need to stop. So I thought, man, when I get this Letterman's jacket, then I'm going to be, like, happy. Like, like the, you know, when I was in, you're in high school, you dream big dreams. Come on. Like, I was like, man, I get this Letter, Letterman jacket, I'm going to be good. Like, I'm going to be real good. So I got the Letterman's jacket. And in my mind, it overpromised and underdelivered. <laughs> I wasn't that good. <laughs> and, but listen, as we get older, there are different types of lies we believe. We can think to ourselves, man, once, once I get at this level of my organization, then I'll be happy. Once I, I, once I get my, my, my JD, then I'll be happy. Once I'm done with graduate school, then I'll be happy. Once I get married, then I'll be happy. Once I'm no longer married, hopefully that's not, <laughs> then I'll be happy. Once we have kids, then I'll be happy. Once my kids are grown and gone, then we'll be happy. 
but, but again, it's this constant pursuit of how. Here's what Jesus says. Blessed are those who hear my words and what? Put them into practice. Blessed, happy are you when, you when you not only know the word of God, but you actually do the word of God when your faith has deeds. So faith trusts. Faith acts. Here's the last word. Faith expects. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. He tested him. There will come a time in your life when your faith will be tested. If you've experienced this, can you say amen? Peter says the testing of your faith is to produce the genuineness of your faith. Uh, I want to commend you even here this morning because I think the past two years have been a test of faith for many of you. And that you're here. And there probably were times you didn't feel like it. Aren't you grateful faith isn't a feeling? But there's a testing of our faith that comes. James says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, mind you, when James says consider it pure joy, a more accurate, rep, a more accurate translation says consider it only joy. In other words, don't be anxious. Don't be frustrated. Don't be angry. Don't be depressed. Don't be discouraged. That sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it, coming from the brother of Jesus? He says consider only joy when you face trials of many kinds. Now he gives the reason why. He says, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That word perseverance means your faith will be strengthened. And let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature. That word mature means spiritual growth and complete. That word complete actually translates perfect. It's the same word referenced when it refers to heaven. That, that, that when, you're, when you face trials, have joy because your faith is strengthened. And catch this you'll experience more of heaven on earth. Watch what Paul says in, in, in 2 Corinthians where he says that it's, that it's in my weakness God's strength is perfected. So James says consider it joy when you go through hardships. Consider it joy when you're let go. Consider it joy when you face illness. Consider it joy when you're facing, mind you, he's writing to a people group who are being socially and economically persecuted because of their faith. He says, consider it joy. Why? Because your faith is going to be strengthened and heaven is going to touch earth in your life. Think about it. It's oftentimes we do not experience the power of God as a God who meets all of our needs according to his riches in Christ until we have a need. We don't experience his healing power until we're sick. We, we don't experience what he can fully do in our life until we're in need, which is why both James and Paul says we rejoice in hardship. We rejoice in difficulty. It produces a strengthened faith. Anybody else you ever wish certain parts of the Bible weren't in there? Come on. That's one of them. That's one of them. But can I tell you, listen, an easy life is not a blessed life. Sometimes a very hard life is a blessed life. Have you ever experienced this, where actually it was through the hardships of life you experienced how good God is in this life? That it was actually in the hardships of life you experienced the power of God in your life? Perhaps the things you're trying to pray to go away and to get out of your life, God's saying, if you would just allow me to strengthen your faith in this moment, heaven would touch earth in this situation. Got quiet in this church. We'll move on. It says in verse 17 that Abraham, that even though God said to Abraham, it is through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned. I want you to watch this. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. On a side note, faith and reason are actually partners, not opponents. He reasoned that God could raise him. Some people think, well, if you have faith, it means you're not thinking. No, Abraham was like, I, I, I know I have a history with God. I've seen the faithfulness of God. Therefore, I can reason based upon his faithfulness, based upon his character, that he is a God who raises the dead back to life. So if he did it then, he can do it now. 
That's why it's so important, church, we know the word of God because we can say, listen, if God parted the Red Sea then, he can do it in my life now. If he moved then, he can move now. We can reason that God can raise the dead to life. He had an expectation. Abraham, listen, be careful over the course of your life. You do not have more faith in natural occurrences than you have in a supernatural God. Catch the words of Paul in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly and above all we could ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. I was challenged recently by my three-year-old daughter, Abigail. She was at the store with, with Christina. Christina called me, and I was like, hey, how's it going? She said, Abby has eight dresses that she's pulled off the rack, and she is convinced she's going, that we're going to buy them for her. My girl loves some dresses. And, and you, you like, she, 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 she believes, she, you, you can't take Abby in a store because she believes you can buy the whole store. Like, you got this. I'm just going to pick out what I want. You write the check, right? <laughs> so, so as I was thinking about that, the Lord challenged me. Because, see, Abby has faith, had faith that Christina, she has faith that me can, can buy these things for her. What she don't know, her dad don't roll like that. Come on, somebody. Her mom don't roll like that. Here's a God I felt in my spirit speak to me. That God, why, he said, Jeremy, why does Abby have more faith in you than sometimes you have in me? That I have limitations, but God knows no limitations. That, that I, 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 I'm not all powerful, but he is all powerful. And here's what I want to speak to you today. Listen, do do. Do you still believe that God can do exceedingly abundantly and above all you could ever ask, think, or imagine? Let me ask you this. When's the last time you prayed a prayer that if God didn't do it, it wouldn't happen? Do your prayers, listen, let me, let me just challenge you with this. Do you pray for things that either you could do or someone else can do? Or do you pray for things that only God himself could do? Can I tell you bold prayers honor God? When's the last time you asked God for something that, God, if you do not do this, the doctor said it won't happen. So if you don't heal her, she won't be healed. That the real estate agent said, we can't get this house. So if you don't work in the situation, it's not going to happen. When's the last time you asked God to do something that only he could do? He does exceedingly, abundantly, and above all you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Do you believe a church? Listen, I think, I, I, felt, I, felt, I felt an assignment from the Lord today to stir your faith. Because I know this over the past two years, what we've all walked through. And as you look, as Christina said, you look naturally what's happening at an unstable economy, wars and rumors of wars, a pandemic that is still persevering. Can I tell you, church, what we need more than ever before is a move of an all-powerful, supernatural God. And I want to stir your faith today as the people of God, that he is still a God that can do exceedingly, abundantly, and above more we can ever ask, think, or imagine. It does not mean we're blind to reality. I just don't have more faith for what the news is saying than I have for what my God can do. He can bring wars to a close. He can end a pandemic. He can heal a sick body. He can stabilize an economy. But even if he does, watch this. My hope isn't in a pandemic ending. My hope isn't in an economy thriving. My hope isn't in the things of this world. It is in a God who can do exceedingly, abundantly above. My last scripture, and we're going to close. It's at the end of Hebrews, or middle of Hebrews 11, he says, referring to these people of faith, that all of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. 
admitting they were foreigners and strangers on this earth. Instead, they were longing for a better country. Everyone say, better country. Everyone say, this is not my home. A heavenly one. That God is unashamed to be their God. For he has prepared a city for them. The reason they had a faith that, could, that God rewards is because they were fixated on eternity. They weren't fixated on this earth. They were focused on the city God prepared for them.